Hello, folks. We're going to get going here in a minute. We've got a good crowd coming today. Welcome everybody, we'll be getting going in just a minute. Thank you for, for being here. Welcome folks, we're gonna be getting going in just a minute. For now, we'll go in about 30 seconds, okay? Sure. Welcome everybody. Try to start and end on time here in NDN. Welcome Maria. Maria, if you, if you can't see the deck, uh, let us know, okay? But I think you should all should be able to see the deck. Here. Okay, we're going to begin, folks. I know we have a few more people who are intending to participate, but I want to. We try to start and end on time here at NDN. Welcome, everybody. I'm Simon Rosenberg from NDN. We're hosting a terrific discussion today, and we're really grateful for you taking time to be with us. Uh, joining me for a, a, a talk about the Hispanic vote, which is something that's been very much in the news and discussed uh, in national politics. And in recent months is Fernand Amandi, a dear old friend. Fernand and I have been working together for several decades. Uh, you know, our organizations helped pioneer a strategy for the Democratic Party with Hispanic voters two decades ago. Um, he, uh, he has, what we're gonna be looking at today is polling he's done for uh, Future Majority, our good friends at Future Majority, Mark Little and his team uh, of Hispanic voters in Arizona, Nevada, and Pennsylvania. We'll be presenting those findings for you today. And then I'm gonna be spending a little bit of time talking about national and state trends with Hispanic voting. And then we will open it up for your questions and comments and suggestions uh, afterwards. I, our presentation will go about 20 minutes uh, together and then we'll open it up for a discussion. And Fernand, welcome. Thank you so much. Why don't you take it away? Thank you so much, Simon. And there's been so much interested talk about the Hispanic vote. We've seen this vote really in the last 20 years become not only a growing vote, it's the fastest growing segment of the American electorate, but really in a lot of key states and in the national dynamic, uh, one of the more influential votes. So with that in mind, to Simon's point, Future Majority wanted to commission us to really do a deep dive and look at the Hispanic vote in three different but influential states across the country. So what we did here is we did 1,800 completed interviews. Uh, I know oftentimes there is a lot of uh, chatter in the media and in the conventional wisdom about how the Hispanic vote is performing nationally. Uh, I remind you that oftentimes those tend to be on the basis of smaller sample size uh, polls of anywhere sometimes even as low as 180, 200 voters. This is 1,800 votes combined with 600 samples in each of the following three states, Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania. And the reason we chose those three states is A, they give us a nice geographical balance. You got a little bit of the Southwest, certainly an influential state in the Northeast. It's also states where you have a competitive US Senate election and a competitive gubernatorial statewide election. 
Uh, you'll see that we were in the field in mid-May, so these are very fresh uh, numbers. Obviously, you always poll in English and Spanish based on language of preference. But again, I think the reason we're so confident, and I think all of you, especially those of you in media, should think about these as more authoritative polls, is because of the high sample size, which also utilize a gold standard of methodology, which is a combination hybrid of live telephone operator and also online panels to make sure we're getting the young voters, the young Hispanic voters, uh, all of these based on the voter file. So with that said, I think the story really begins in how the two parties are perceived. And you'll see that it's a very different dynamic. Uh, when it comes to the Democratic Party, in Arizona, right now, the Democratic Party is a plus 24. So, you know, despite the fact that there may be concerns about the party across the country, at least from the perspective of Hispanic voters in Arizona, the party brand is still strong, plus 24. In the state of Nevada, it's close, it's plus 23. And in Pennsylvania, it's plus 36. So sure, these numbers could be higher, might even want to be higher if you're looking at it from a Democratic prison, but they're still well above water. By contrast, the Republicans in these three states have a major branding problem. In Arizona, they're badly underwater, minus 20. In Nevada, a little bit closer, but still minus seven. And in Pennsylvania, it's minus 23. So while it may be true that in some states, like my home state of Florida, the Democratic Party may have a brand problem. It's the Republicans that have the bigger branding problem in these three critical states where we know there's going to be competitive Senate and gubernatorial elections. I think that's further exacerbated by how you look at it on the basis of the image ratings of the two titular leaders of the two parties. Starting with a reminder slide, this is how the Hispanic vote went for Biden versus Trump in each of these three states. And I think it's a good indicator of what the potential floor and ceiling could be. Uh, in Arizona, Biden won plus 24. He got 61 to Trump's 37. In Nevada, it was a plus 26 with 61% to 35% for Trump. And in Pennsylvania, it was a plus 42, 69, 27. How does that impact President Biden's approval ratings today in these three states from the vantage point of Hispanic voters? Well, you look at it first, starting with President Trump, Trump, by almost every indicator in Arizona, Nevada, and Pennsylvania, continues to be badly underwater. Trump is a defined brand, and it's a bankrupt brand if you look at it from the perspective. They know who he is, and they still don't like him. Even in an environment where the national indicators suggest Democrats may be a little bit vulnerable, the head of the Republican Party, Donald Trump, is still seen very poorly. By contrast, President Biden's numbers while nothing really to write home about in Arizona and Nevada, they're still above water. They're still performing higher with Hispanic voters than you tend to see in the national job approval rating numbers. And in Pennsylvania, downright good numbers. Whether that's the kid from Scranton effect, I don't know. But Pennsylvania consistently a much stronger state. But you see, even based on what he did in 2020, he's not quite uh, uh, on his approval rating where his vote number was. Yet nonetheless, it's a Trump problem more than a Biden problem on image rating. How does that impact the general election horse race from the generic ballot? Well, I know there's a lot of talk that uh, so goes Biden's approval rating is how Democrats will perform. We are not seeing that just yet in these three states. How do we know? Because if you look at these three states on the generic ballot question, we are overperforming Biden's job approval rating in Arizona. Democrats are plus 29, in Nevada, plus 25, and in Pennsylvania, plus 35. So despite Biden's soft approval numbers, even with Hispanic voters, it's not acting as an obstacle or an impediment to how they're looking at the generic ballot. That This is even starker when you look at it in the context of the U.S. Senate and the gubernatorial statewide races. Just a little bit of context here. First off, the data reveals that the 2020 Democratic Senate candidates have significant leads over every single one of their Republican opponents. And the question becomes, is this going to be more like a 2020 environment or a 2018 environment, which was a Democratic blue wave? And when you look at it, these numbers, as you'll see in a second, seem to be more like 2018 than 2020. Uh, Cinema won the Hispanic vote by 40 in 2018, Kelly won it in Arizona by 30. 
Senator Rosen won it by 37 and 18, and Casey won it by 38 points in 2018. Let me show you how those numbers bear out right now in horse race matchups in each of these three states. Let's start with Arizona. And here, Kelly is in very strong shape. Uh, whether it's against Brunovich or Lehman, he's got massive leads, plus 46, plus 39, blowing past even what Biden did against Trump two years ago in these three, in these, against these two contenders. In Nevada, the incumbent Senator Cortez Masto also with very strong numbers. She's plus 38 over Adam Laxalt. And in Pennsylvania, at one point when we were in the field, it looked like McCormick might each eke out the nominee. Fetterman, who is still largely unknown with Hispanic voters, even in Pennsylvania, is a plus 34. How does he stack up with who we know will be the nominee? It's Dr. Oz, much higher. He's already at a plus 46. So when it comes to these Senate races, Democrats look to be in very strong shape at this stage. And I actually think there's an opportunity to get these numbers even potentially higher in the low 70s, which is what should be the national democratic goal for the Hispanic vote. That is what Obama got in 2012. We were part of that effort. I think they can do it again with the right kind of campaign. When you look at the gubernatorial horse races, a similar story. Uh, in 2018 in Arizona, by, con by, by contrast, the Democratic nominee was a Hispanic, David Garcia, who won the Hispanic vote then by 12 points despite losing the general election. In Nevada, the current governor, Sisolak, he won the Hispanic vote by 37 points. And in 2018, Governor Wolf won by 36 points. Democrats in 2022, they should be very pleased with the results you're about to see in Arizona and Pennsylvania. And while they have a lead in Nevada, I think Governor Sisolak is a little bit softer there than he should be. Let me show you the numbers. Let's look at Arizona. Katie Hobbs, who's again, largely unknown, she's already doubling what the Hispanic Democratic nominee got in 2018. She's plus 24 over Lake. She's got still not only room for growth with Hispanics, I think those numbers can go higher. In the state of Nevada, here's where you see Sisolak underperforming a little bit vis-a-vis -vis what he got in 2018. He can do some work here and he's gonna have to, but again, still numbers above the 50 percentile range. And in Pennsylvania, uh, Shapiro is plus 38 over Mastriano, who seems to be a very extreme radicalized candidate the Republicans nominated. So again, not even quite as strong as the Senate numbers, but still very good numbers overall that I think belie the idea that Biden's approval rating is an albatross on Democratic prospects in these three, these three states for the uh, Senate and gubernatorial races. How does the most important issue impact that because I know there's a lot of talk about the bread and butter issues in the economy. Is that act acting also as an anchor uh, for democratic chances and a problem? Well, the answer is no. And how do we know? Because in spite of the fact that in all three states, yes, inflation and the economy were far and away cited as the number one issues and the most important issues, we, by the way, ask these questions open-ended, volunteered, so that people are actually giving us what they are telling us uh, without any choices, what is their most important priority? As you saw prior, that is not acting as an impediment necessarily for how they're actually voting for Senate and for governor. All right, a couple of other things. We happened to get into the field just after the news broke that the Supreme Court might be overturning Roe v. Wade and what the impact on that might be. There's a big conventional wisdom out there, I think in the media, which is correct, I might add, that Hispanic voters individually tend to be more conservative on the question of abortion. And I think that's a fact when it comes to their personal belief systems. Many of them at the individual level, if you ask them, tend to have a more pro-life than pro-choice position. But when you actually put the question to them, do you think abortion should be legal or illegal in the United States? Look what happens uh, in Arizona plus 30 on the question of legality. In Nevada, that's plus 40. In Pennsylvania, plus 41. So there is a line too far for Hispanic voters themselves when it comes on what they think should be the legality of the policy for others. And I think this is a sign that the Republicans may have overreached on this issue. How do I know that? Well, look at this next slide. 
Will the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade ending federal protections for abortions have any impact on your voting decisions in the November 2022 elections? In Arizona, 45% of all Hispanic voters say they're more likely to vote for the Democrats just on the basis of this issue. In Nevada, it's 40% more likely. In Pennsylvania, also 45%. So not to suggest that this issue be in all, uh, is a silver bullet and a be all end all issue, but there clearly is some traction here and there clearly are some signs that Republicans may have a problem. When it comes to the other battery now on uh, safety, we know crime, the concerns about the border, the concerns about what's happening in the world. Which of the two parties do you believe is doing a better job at keeping you and your family safe, the Republican or the Democratic Party? Here, Arizona, Democrats are plus 12. In Arizona, they're plus 10. And in Pennsylvania, they're plus 30. Again, decent numbers, but I believe that there's actually potential room for growth on these numbers, especially if you look at how the, uh, the voters are actually voting on the ballot horse race questions. And this is a, an important question, I think, going forward. Democrats have an opportunity from a messaging perspective to define and own this issue. This is also true on a question that uh, our firm has been polling for decades. And I got to give a lot of a tip of the hat here to Simon Rosenberg and the NDN team, because I know they were very uh, adamant that this question on which of the two parties do you believe is better at creating opportunities for you and your family to get ahead and live a better life? They've seen this as the essential question. So many Hispanic parents, grandparents, and great grandparents came to the United States for this titular question to provide a better life for themselves, their children, and their grandchildren. And on this question, the Democrats again have significant leads over the Republicans, especially in Pennsylvania. But in Arizona and Nevada, I also think there is an opportunity to grow these numbers. These numbers really should be higher and I think can be higher, particularly if the Democrats make the message around some of the policy prescriptions that they've done, whether it be health care, whether it be the economic job creations that have happened under this administration to really drill down and, and win and cement this idea of there being the party that has allowed their families to get ahead and live a better life. Finally, on message testing, we wanted to really look at how the two parties present themselves. And what do we really learn? Uh, in these three states, at least, the MAGA message just isn't selling well or closing the deal with Hispanic voters this coming midterms. How do we know that? Well, let me show you the two messages we presented. One is kind of the elevator pitch message for the Democrats, for the people. The other is the MAGA, uh, America First message. And, and we thought these were very uh, fair, good faith arguments that we've actually seen the Republicans make. We've certainly seen some Democrats make. The Democratic message was a candidate who is for the people and delivered on building a stronger America by investing in infrastructure and families, creating millions of middle class jobs and cracking down on corruption and defending democracy and freedom. The MAGA message is a candidate who will make America great by getting inflation under control, by cutting the out of control government spending getting people back to work, cracking down on violent crime is against the teachings of critical race theory and will secure the Southern border with Mexico. When we match these messages head to head to see if either of them move the needle, the results I think are dramatic. And keep in mind, a message that moves the needle is a message that gets more than 60, 65% support. And in Arizona, Nevada, and Pennsylvania, in almost every case, not only was it in the mid 60s, it got even up into the low 70s, plus 39 in Arizona, plus 33 in Nevada, plus 49. If the Democrats can make this election a referendum on this choice, the choice that MAGA is presenting and the choice that they are presenting, I think they can get these numbers to where we helped President Obama get in 2012, which was historic, historic support for Hispanics. I think the ceiling is in the low 70s. The 70, 71% range is and should be and can be what the Democrats are aiming for with the right approach. And I think that is exacerbated by the underperformance of Republicans. I remind you just two years ago, in these three states, Trump got 37, 35, 27% of the vote. Yet now by all of the indicators here, whether it's by Senate support, governor support, voter intent, or the MAGA question that you just saw, 
Dep Republicans are underperforming in every single indicator, and they're significantly underperforming at that. To the extent that there is a problem with Hispanic voters, it's the Republicans who have that problem in these three states. So to recap, the Democratic branded candidates are performing well, the Republican branded candidates are not. These do look more like blue midterm uh, wave 2018 numbers than the 2020 numbers where there was some Hispanic erosion. The abortion debate, to the extent that it helps somebody, it's likely, likely to help Democrats in these three states. I think these findings also refute a lot of the core narratives that the GOP has stolen or taken away the Hispanic vote. Uh, not in these three states, not now in June of 2022. And I think the findings make a powerful case. If the Democrats run smart, strategic, well-funded, and well-focused uh, efforts around the Latino vote, they can have significant payoff. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Simon. Renaud, if you can, yeah, take down, let me now share my screen here. Okay, can you see this, Fernand? Can you see my- Yes, I sure can. <clears throat> so part of the reason that we, I'm hosting this event today, as many of you know, we've worked on these issues around Hispanic voters for a long time. 20 years ago, our project was launched with Bob Menendez and Ken Salazar right, right around this time, 20 years ago. And you know, I've been intrigued by this idea that there is this concept of erosion or that Republicans have somehow fundamentally started to shape and change the relationship of their party to Republicans, I mean, to Hispanics, in a time when the Republican Party has embraced a degree of xenophobia and racism that is far beyond what they had ever done in recent times. And I always found this to be intriguing. And I, and I just, to be honest with you, I didn't really know the answer to this question. And But what confused me is I never understood how it could be that there was erosion for Democrats with Hispanics if we've won four Senate seats in the Southwest in the last two elections, and we won all four Southwestern states in the last presidential election for the first time since 1940, right? So let me, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you <clears throat> um, just a piece of the national Hispanic vote, which is the, the performance of the two parties in the Southwest, and which is we define as being Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico. And so this is, first off, this is the, I'm just gonna go through this. Uh, this is the, the total vote numbers we are using from a, 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 a SUNY uh, projection of the Hispanic vote nationally. The DNR numbers are exit poll numbers. And then I'll go into the details on this. But in 1992, there were 4.2 million Hispanic votes in America. Bill Clinton won those voters according to the exit polls. And we use the exit polls throughout this presentation just because it's apples to apples you know, throughout. I mean, there's lots of other data that have things a little bit different here and there, but we're just using exit polls for ease here today. So Democrats, Clinton won the Hispanic vote, you know, 61, 25, 36 point margin. That netted Democrats 1.5 million votes. Democrats won 17 of these 25 electoral college votes in these states. We won five of the eight Senate seats. We won seven of the 17 House seats in this region, and we won 37 House seats when you combine California Democratic uh, seats plus the Southwest, right? Sort of the Mexican-American part of the United States without Texas, right? That's part of what we're looking at here today. Now, fast forward to 1996, Clinton you know, pushed those numbers way up to the low 70s, as Fernand was talking about. The net Democratic vote share here was 2.5 million. And again, strong showing the Electoral College, fell, fell back a little bit in the Senate and, and in the House, right? So only 32 seats altogether in California in the House for the Democrats. Then Bush comes along in 2000 and changes the game. And, you know, Democratic margin now is, you know, is less than, it. He, the Democrats lose a million votes here. We only win five of the 25 Southwestern Electoral College votes, right? The only state in the Southwest that, uh, Gore won was, was New Mexico. Uh, in the Senate, we were only now have two seats. We have five in the House, so 37 seats altogether back to where we were. NDN gets involved because of this. In 2002, with Sergio Ben Dixon, Fernand's firm, 
uh, and Bob Menendez and Ken Salazar, we launched our Hispanic project to challenge Democrats to understand that Bush had a national strategy and that it was central to his election victory. I can show you that in an election where he only got 271 electoral college votes, this shift in the Southwest in Florida was the difference between him winning and losing the presidency. So the Hispanic vote, the Republican strength with Hispanics delivered the presidency to their party in 2000. There's no doubt in my mind that that happened. And in 2004, we see now Bush getting up according to the exits up to, you know, significant gains. The Democratic margin is fundamentally disappearing here. Bush wins all four Southwestern states, right? And in an election, again, he barely won. And then the Democratic, you know, we now minus 14 here. We gained a few seats in California, but very strong performance. The Southwest now in 2004 is a Republican leaning region of the country. Our project, you know, argues in the time that we needed a national strategy. We ran ads in all four of these states in the 2004 election in Spanish, um, but we had a lot of work to do here. Working, you know, Fernand's firm was involved in this. I was involved in this as well in 2008. Obama goes back to a very strong place with Hispanics. The electorate continues to grow. Our net margin now is three and a half million votes here. This is a big deal, right? And, and nationally, 19 of the 29 electoral college votes, right? Senate five of eight, now big gains in the House. We now are taking away 49 seats in this region, right, up from 32. So this is 17 point gain of seats in, in, in the House during this period, just in a very short period of time, very consequential for the balance of power, right? You know, Democrats win the House in 20, 2006. 2012, as Fernand mentioned, Obama gets all the way up to 71. We're now talking about 5 million net votes coming from Hispanics for Democrats. This is a crazy number. Um, you know, we're, the Southwest though is still, we're still struggling. We didn't win Arizona. Five of eight Senate seats, 12 of 23 House seats. So we're starting to see now that this region is starting to trend back to being a Democratic, lean Democratic region. 2016, Hillary, very similar results. She drops back a little bit in the region, but still, we lose the Senate seat, but we're sort of, you know, hitting this place now. And then in 2020, Biden, right, according to the exit polls, gets 65 percent. Look at the growth of the Hispanic electorate in this two, in these two elections, right? Huge increase compared to previous elections. The Democratic margin in 2020 is now five and a half million votes. Biden's margin of victory was seven million votes, right? This is, you know, this is 65, 70 percent of that. For the first time since 1940, we win all of the Southwestern, the four Southwestern states, 31 electoral college votes. We pick up four Senate seats in 2018 and 2020, and now control all eight Senate seats. In the House, we are up to 56 seats in this region, including California. Friends, this is not erosion, right? This is unbelievable success. The success of the Democratic Party strategy to get us from where we were in 2004 to where we are in 2020, I would argue has been the single most successful party-wide strategy in the Democratic Party over the last 20 years. This has been a remarkable success and we now control all state eight Senate seats. We would not have majorities in the House and Senate today without the gains that we've made in this region. Going into the 2024 election, we would also not have an electoral college majority you know, without these states as well. We lost all 31 of these electoral college votes, we would be under 270. So part of what we are doing in this presentation and what we're gonna be doing is, Fernand showed you that we didn't find erosion. In fact, we found 2018 like numbers in this, in this part of the country. Um, we saw a little weakness in Nevada and we can talk about the difference between Arizona and Nevada in the Q and A here. But I think this perception that there's been some kind of fundamental shift or erosion or weakness with Democrats and Hispanics is false and wrong. And all of us need to challenge this far more aggressively. This has been wildly successful. Yes, there's been a setback in Florida. We don't really know what's going on in Texas and we're gonna be polling. I don't think there's a lot, I don't think there's great data coming out of Texas. And the way I would view this is that Democrats have had an amazing success and we've had a setback in Florida. There's no but, there's no but here. It's success and we've got work to do in Florida. And I think we're going to be working hard to try to change the narrative. And for everyone who participated in this, Maria Cardona is on the call today, who played an integral role in this back 
in these day, early days. This has been something we should be very proud of. And for the Hispanic community, I think they need to understand the margins that they're delivering for Democrats. We've picked up 5 million additional votes from the Hispanic community since 2004. This is a remarkable thing. And now we're gonna turn it, open it up uh, to Q&A for all of you. And I appreciate this first time I've ever shown this slide. Uh, let me go back to the, uh, get us back here. Sorry, give me a second. There are days where I feel like I know what I'm doing with Zoom and there are days where I feel Zoom is smarter than I am. Okay, um, let me take down the, hold on, sorry everybody. So is it, I don't know if people can just see the two of us, but I'm gonna go back and yeah, this up. You got, Simon, you just gotta hit the stop share screen. It should be at the top, stop sharing, and then it'll go back to a default. I thought it did, hold on a second. Okay, you got us now. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions. You guys all are Zoom warriors. You know how to weigh in here. Uh, so for not, I'll moderate this part. If you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box or raise your hand. Uh, John has a question. What does this mean? You know, what do Democrats need to win Latino votes in order to win these states? You know, the basic answer to that is what Fernand has, and he's been arguing this all along, is that for Democrats looking at at what is going to be a tough and challenging year in 2022, the water is warm here with Hispanics. We got to dive into this warm water. We've got to push our margins up as high as we can. We need to win. Uh, you know, we need to have turnout be as high as possible. You know, one of the things we all have to keep in mind with the Hispanic community is that it is a much higher percentage of infrequent and new voters than the overall electorate. So it means we have to earn the votes of Hispanics every two years. This is not a base voting block. We showed that already with Bush and the numbers that he got. Republicans can make gains. They made gains in 2000 and 2004. They made gains in Florida in recent elections. This is not a lock vote. And we have to really view this vote at very differently, I think, than we do, which is in some ways you could argue that this is the best money we could spend. The margins are huge uh, and we have to keep growing our margins and what is going to be a tough here. Fernand, do you want to add to that? No, I mean, I think that's exactly right. And one thing, Simon, you made the point in your analysis that I think is worth bearing out here is just the explosive growth of the, the vote and how that is impacting. You've not only got an opportunity to have a bigger piece of the pie, but the pie slice is growing. Just a quick number. In 2014, which wasn't even 10 years ago, it was only eight years ago, the midterm vote was about 6.7 million. The, the anticipated midterm vote now in terms, I'm not talking about eligible votes, but those that will vote are over 11 and a half million. So it's close to having doubled in just eight years, which is remarkable. But again, Democrats cannot just assume this is a base vote. There has to be the work on the margins. The trick of the Hispanic vote for Democrats is managing those margins because it's a significant difference to win the Hispanic vote by 40 points as opposed to winning the Hispanic vote by 25. There is no danger that the Republicans will win the Hispanic vote in 2022 or 2024. But what they've done successfully in some states and some areas is to eat away at those margins. If Democrats recognize that their goal, I think, should be 70% nationally, and in some states it's going to go a little higher, some states it may be a little lower, but kind of in the 70 range on average then they're gonna have a very successful midterm election and it's gonna be on the strength of Hispanic support. I think what, if I can just make two quick additional points. Fernand is arguing that we have to have more ambition here, right? That we have to push this as hard as we can. That it, it is a vote that is performs for us and we have to invest into it and have more ambition than we, uh, I think, have. And I, and I think that's obviously a big part of it. The other thing I would just encourage everybody, you know, the memo, that has all this data is on uh, the Future Majority website. We've linked to it and you can find it. Is that the, for those of us who've been working on this in a long, for a long time, the numbers, the party brand numbers in Arizona are better than they are in Nevada right now. You know, the Democratic Party's margins are bigger, the brand numbers. Arizona, the, you know, this is almost an unimaginable thing, right? I mean, we've won both of the Senate seats in the last two elections, which was, you know, Arizona was always 
like the, in our work was always sort of the holy grail, right? Like if we could get Arizona to flip, you know, we'll, we knew New Mexico and Nevada and Colorado were moving in the right direction. Arizona was this place we always couldn't get to. There has been a really dramatic, I think, set of circumstances that have happened in Arizona politics. Mark Kelly is running 10 points ahead of where he was in the last election with Hispanics right now. And I think some of this has to do with, in Arizona in the last year and a half, the ongoing fight over the vote, the, you know, the contested vote in the presidential election has been very front and center in the state. And I think that you're seeing sort of MAGA is eroding the Republican brand there. And we have very strong, good Democrats. But Nevada, as Fernand went through, there, there was some weakness there, right? I mean, there's a little bit of weakness there compared to Arizona. I don't, I'm still stunned when I watched this data today, to me, that was the most stunning thing that Arizona really may be slipping away from the Republican party. Um, and certainly, you know, Kelly, I don't, I don't even know if the Senate race is gonna be close at this point. I mean, it will be close of course, but I don't know that it's really gonna be close in the way that we would imagine. And the governor's race, I mean, they've nominated somebody who's gonna be very, very hard to elect in Arizona. So there's been a big change in Arizona nationally um, and it's something that is recent, and it and I think it's lasting and significant based on the numbers that we're seeing. Let me. Um, I know that Maria, you had raised your hand, but you dropped back down. Um, and then Eli raises an important question, right? That you know, also that we know that Hispanic Latino voters are not just one community. There are several, you know, in Florida. Part of the part of the future majority project, Eli, is to get. You know, I, and this is somebody who's been working in this for 20 years. I think there's, I don't know how useful the concept of a national Hispanic vote is anymore, right? Given the size of this electorate, you know, I mean, it's gone up, you know, threefold, fourfold since we, since 1992. And part of what we're pointing out here is that you're seeing today the differences in the Mexican American vote in the Southwest from the heavily Puerto Rican vote, which is a little, you traditionally a little bit more democratic in Pennsylvania. And then obviously Florida and Texas have very unique electorates. And I think it's gonna get more important as we go forward. And the reason we're polling in states and not doing a national poll is to try to tease out these differences, right? To educate uh, political operatives and national Democrats. Because I do think that part of what's happened with the national narrative is the Republicans have been able to frankly bamboozle um, people on arguing that the loss of ground in, with Hispanic voters in Florida is somehow also showing a loss of ground with Hispanic voters everywhere, which obviously didn't happen in 2020. And it didn't happen, it's not happening in these polls. And I think we can all be more precise in our analysis, given how this is now such an important part, such a, an important and growing part of the electorate. So I think, yeah. I think Eli, that's gonna be baked into the future majority work that Fernand's doing. Yeah, just just to hammer down that point, Ellie, it, it is true that, you know, Florida is a problem. Florida is a particular challenge for Democrats that, uh, you know, they have to figure that out if they want to do what they did in 2008 and 2012, which is to win statewide again. Um, the prospects right now in Florida do not look good, despite having an incredible candidate in Val Demings and a, and a true and tested candidate like Charlie Crist for governor. But to Simon's point, just because it's happening in Florida doesn't mean that that's being exported to the other 49. We'll, well, the data that we do going forward will tell us definitively if that issue has been extrapolated to other parts. I know there's a lot of interest in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, for example, maybe even some certain congressional districts in the California or New York area. But as Simon says, this notion that the Democrats have lost traction with Hispanic voters in these three critical states is just simply not supported by the data. And I'm just going to put an exclamation point on that. Because it's not happening in these states, it means that it's not happening, right? I mean, this is just a basic statistical issue, right? There is no erosion with Hispanic voters in the United States. There may be erosion in some places, but we are finding, in fact, no erosion in these states. Therefore, the Hispanic vote is not eroding, right? I mean, this is really important just as a issue of fact and data, right? And um, and in fact, as we showed that the 2020 was the first year in 80 years that Democrats won you know, all four Southwestern states. It was a year of expansion and growth, not a year of, of, of retreat or erosion. Let me call Maria, who's you know, our sister. Welcome, Maria. Uh, if you can unmute yourself. Hey, can you hear me? 
Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks for being here. Um, no, of course. This is, as you know, near and dear to my heart since we, you know, launched it, and I'm so proud of this. Um, and and so, so I guess two things. Um, for the purposes of 2022, this is like super important and relevant because Pennsylvania would be a pickup for us, for the Senate. And that's a huge deal given, you know, everyone's hand wringing that we're going to lose both houses. And this is like, I think, should give us a big, um, you know, a, a big boost of hope, given that, given if we actually, you know, heed the advice, which is that we need to make sure to invest and really do what we need to do to continue to increase um, our share of the Hispanic vote. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is, it seems to me and would love to ask both you, Simon and Fernand, in terms of extrapolating for, you know, just other polls, I know you guys didn't do general market polls, but it seems to me that what's happening in these states is that people are looking at the candidates and the party, not necessarily Joe Biden, because that is how everyone is proclaiming the death knell for Democrats is because Joe Biden's approval ratings are so low. And the argument that I've been making is, you know, be that as it may, he is, you know, and, and you can argue that it, it, that midterms are always a referendum on the White House, and, and that could be true, but we could make it, if we make it a contrast between the actual candidates in each of these um, races, you know, both districts, congressional, as well as Senate, given that there are some candidates that are so just, you know, batshit crazy, that it doesn't have to be the death knell for us. And, and, and if we continue to do what we, what we need to do with Hispanic votes across the board, that could be a nice cushion and perhaps a saving grace. So I want to put Maria, that out there. It's, Maria, it's a very important and a sophisticated and a nuanced point that you're making that I think bears a little bit of just a quick amount of time to explain. Because the truth is, in 2018, the midterms were a referendum on Donald Trump. It was mm -hmm. a referendum on a president that a lot of Americans were concerned about. And while historically the midterms tend to be what it was in 2018, a referendum on the presidency or the president at the time, these numbers in these three states with this slice of the voters suggest it's not the case to your point. And I think part of the reason for that, Maria, as you lay out very nicely is because the perception is that while yes, they may not be tickled pink about President Biden right now, the contrast, the choice of an extreme Republican radicalized party with candidates who represent the MAGA wing uh, aren't quite cu cu cutting the deal and presenting that alternative. So yes, I think approval rating is not the metric necessarily because we don't see it correlating to how they're voting on Senate and governor in these states. I mean, let me make a few points on that, on that is that there are no hard and fast rules in politics and every election is unique. And this notion that things are gonna happen this year because they happened before is just silly, right? And it's lazy and it's just not actually how politics ever works, right? Every election has its own dynamics. There's no election that's like any other election. This, is, this election has its own unique dynamics. And the thing that I think most commentators are leaving out of their own analysis is that there is a clear anti-MAGA majority in the United States. Uh, you know, we won the 2018 election with eight and a half by eight and a half percent of the vote, a historically high turnout. We won the last election by four and a half percent with a historically high turnout. Um, no political ideology or party has had more people vote against it than the Republicans and MAGA in American history. And so there is an anti-MAGA majority. And, and so the, pro the party that has the math problem is the Republican Party. It's not the Democratic Party because they have to somehow break through and, and hope that that anti-MAGA majority doesn't show up again, because they you could make the argument that they're actually more MAGA today than they were two years ago. And that MAGA is now not just something that is unique to Trump, but it's actually been embraced by the entire Republican party. And I do think the issues around uh, the other piece of this, Maria, and it's very relevant to Hispanic, the Hispanic electorate, 
is the big variable in midterm elections is turnout. People have been mentioning in the Q&A. The group that's least, the two groups that are least likely to turn out are, you know, because the Democratic Party has more voters than the Republicans do, but we have more episodic or infrequent voters, right? So turnout is a bigger issue for us than it is for Republicans oftentimes. And that's changing a little bit, but that's just as a general rule. The issues that have just come up recently with Roe v. Wade and guns speak very powerfully to younger Americans, right? I mean, people who are most concerned about choice are people in childbearing years, right? Men and women who are, this is a very real issue for them in their lives. And the gun issue we know really impacts younger people. If what's happened in the last few weeks is that young Americans have woken up and are more likely now to participate in the election, and this is not a part of the electorate that's 20, 25 points democratic, right? It could have a very, very big impact. And we could see turnout in these midterms be more like 2018, which was historically high numbers then. And, and, and I'll give you an example, right? The Institute of Politics at Harvard, just which does sort of the definitive 18 to 29 year old polling in their recent poll that they just released, the vote intent number in 2022 with 18 to 29 year olds was the same as it was in 2018 at this time. And again, what's very possible is that, and Fernand knows this from polling, if the model of your vote that you're polling on has low participation of young people, low participation of Hispanics, the Hispanic gap closing, you're gonna have bad polling, right, potentially, right? Your, your sample is gonna be more Republican than is the actual vote. And certainly we know from this polling that the Spanish speakers are more democratic than the English speakers. And so if you've been polling this cycle with largely English Hispanic electorates, you're coming out with a more Republican sample, right? Then, then, and so, you know, I think what's interesting to watch is as we get closer to the election is how the Republican and Democratic pollsters are making their assumptions about who's gonna vote. The Democratic pollsters know their electorate better than the Republicans do, right? And, and I think that the, um, it's one of the reasons I think you're seeing huge variances in things as simple as the congressional generic. The congressional generic doesn't usually have massive variances, right? Which is the question of, are you gonna vote Democrat or Republican this fall, right? In this election, you can, you can if you go to 538, you can see plus six, plus seven Republican congressional generic. You can also find plus four, plus five Democrat. These are huge, swings, right? That's not, I mean, it's not. And so this is, there's a lot of volatility. We had a lot of new voters vote in 2020. The electorate expanded dramatically. We really have no, we don't know definitively who's going to vote in this election. But I will tell you that I am more convinced that this anti-MAGA majority is going to show up uh, in, in 2022, the way it did in 2018 and 2020. But we have to spend money towards that. We have to invest in that. We have to, you know, spend into it. And what we're presenting here today is an enormous investment opportunity for Democrats, right? It's not, this is not, these numbers are not cooked. This isn't preordained. This is an opportunity, demography is an opportunity. It's not destiny, right? And, and this kind of numbers that Fernando showed you are an opportunity. It's not a foregone conclusion. And it will only happen if we run good campaigns and spend money towards these voters who are still infrequent and new voters and need to hear from us every two years, right? Before they become regular settled democratic voters. Right? Thanks, Maria. I miss you. By the way, I should say Maria is a senior advisor now to the DNC's project, major Hispanic project that is gearing up for this cycle. And, and, and thank you, Maria. And we're, we're trying to give you ammunition to make sure the DNC and the party committees are spending as much as they can. I want to also just point out one other thing because my friend J.B. Persh for the Senate Majority Pact shared with me the other day is that Fernand showed you there were fairly significant differences in the gubernatorial numbers in Arizona and Nevada than the Senate numbers. And, you know, we've been wondering, you know, why does the Senate look like 2018? And J.B. reminded me that the Senate Majority Pact has been up speaking to Hispanic voters since February. And it could very well be that this expenditure, this investment is really yielding results. I mean, certainly it sure looks that way today. I mean, there's, you know, because the biggest margin in these states wasn't party ID, congressional generic, party favorability. It was the actual vote, right? It was the educated vote, this candidate against this candidate. 
That's where Democrats had yawning margins. That suggests that there's been somebody educating Hispanic voters about the choice. And, and certainly we know the Senate Majority PAC has been in there educating you know, folks about the Senate choices. It seems to be working and hats off to the team at the SNP. Let me see if that's it. Um, Maria, thank you. Hey, everybody, we're going to go. Um, and, and Fernand, closing before we go, Fernand, any final thoughts before we go? Yeah, just, I mean, again, this is the beginning of what are going to be a series of dives into some of these states. So if you found this data interesting, and uh, if there's anything you want to look at as we go into the other states, I'm sure Simon will do more of these. But again, I think one point that Simon made that's worth bringing up is, you know, the old rules of politics don't necessarily apply to this election or this cycle, you know, challenge some of what's out there. And unless some folks are bringing data to support this stuff, uh, I, I would take it with a grain of salt. So we, uh, we look forward to doing this again with the new data and new states, and we'll continue through the end of the cycle. And my final point on this, going back to Maria's question, is that I do think there may have been a decoupling this cycle between Biden's approval rating and the states. And I think the question is, what would be big enough to cause that decoupling? There'd have to be a massive thing. Well, fear of MAGA is big enough. You know, the fear of MAGA made me more powerful than the disappointment in Biden, right? I mean, if you think about it, you could be one of those people who voted for Biden or disappointed in him still voting 100% Democrat, right? You know, and so I think this notion that, the you know, there's no question that Biden's numbers are depressing Democratic numbers. But when you go directly into every race, we're not definitively behind in any Senate race right now. Pennsylvania is looking, you know, like it could go our way if John Fetterman's health holds. Oz is a terrible candidate by any historic measure. And then go spend time in the House races. If the NRCC had a dozen polls showing their candidates up in, in contested House races, those polls would be public right now. They don't, they aren't, they don't exist, right? You can't really find House polls showing our contested candidates behind, right? And in fact, I saw a public poll on Friday showing a Republican dead even, a Republican incumbent dead even in a race. And so I do think that you know, the thing to watch in this election is the actual vote for candidates. And I was at an event the other day with a bunch of members who were up for re-election in contested races. And all of them told me individually that they felt they were in good shape in their race. I mean, they, you know, that they were gonna be okay. I mean, they withstood 2020, they have enough money, you know, they they felt like you know they had enough tools to sort of tell their story. And so it, it's interesting that in the democratic campaign world there isn't really a massive panic right now, right? I mean, things are, I've been through 1994 and 2010. This is not the same as this, right? There were more numbers showing our candidates down than there are right now. Our candidates aren't down. And again, there's an explanation for that, which is that the, the fear of MAGA may be more powerful than the disappointment in Biden, right? But we'll see, that's what this election is gonna be about. Pranan, thanks for your great work. I know that you're planning uh, hopefully to do Texas next, but stay in touch, folks. If you don't know about Future Majority, sign up for their emails. There are our dear friends. Uh, we're helping them a little on this project given our experience, but this is Mark Riddle and his team's great work. Hats off to Mark and Future Majority, this remarkable project, and we're proud to be supporters from, from the outside. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.